Is heaven here or there or is it here? Hi everybody, it's GP Walsh and this is part two of uh, the conversation between myself and Martin Root about Project Heaven on Earth. And in this section we wanted to talk about, we started off by talking about where is heaven? Talking about the, the myth, the story of Adam and Eve. Now many people take it literally and, and even if you if you do take it literally, fine. He's, he actually explored in in all of the the three Abrahamic re, re, religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Just because we were kicked out of the garden, does that mean we can't get back in? Or maybe there's a bigger mission, like we were meant to go out and plant the garden everywhere. It's an important thing. This, you know, our myths and our stories, our ideas about our origin create such energy in our lives. I mean, they really govern our lives. The, uh, our cultural stories determine who we are, how we're going to disport ourselves as human beings, and what's possible for us. So to examine a story that has that is so powerful and so significant to so many people, to find in it hidden gems, opportunities, openings that we didn't realize were there. Maybe this story is an opening to establishing the Garden of Eden everywhere and not just a story about how terrible we were. Maybe it's actually an opportunity. So please join me with part two with Martin Root and is heaven here or there? the 16th century, 15th century, heaven was considered to be just above the ground and going way, way up into infinity. Along comes Galileo with a telescope and looks and doesn't see, quote, heaven. So then heaven had to be farther away. Thus the notion of heaven, and this is really important, not here, not now. Mm. That is, ex for me, extremely important. Yes, we can have little bits of heaven on earth, you know, you and I going out for a good meal or right. uh, my wife's love. But to have this as heaven on earth? No, no, that's impossible. That's impossible. Well, why is it impossible? So does it say that hell on earth has to be? I mean, I don't <laughs> believe, I don't buy that. So the notion of not here, not now, and, and the essence of this work, there's two essences. One is... Yes here, yes now. I think that's part of our job as human beings and as humanity. Mm -hmm. And then in the larger scope, as you engage with heaven on earth for you and I for me and so on and so on and so on other people, what we're doing, GP, is creating and living the new story of what it means to be a human and what it means to be humanity. We are actually naming this new story. 10 or 15 years ago, we heard people say, you know, the current story is not working. We need a new story. The current story is not working. We need a new story. We need a new story. But nobody named that new story. So <laughs> that, that sentence lacked authority. I'm suggesting that we name this new story and then it be named. We are co-creating and experiencing heaven on earth. So heaven on earth is the name of our individual and collective story. Wow. And I find that uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's been clear that for quite a while, probably 50 years, that the, the, that the current story, story is, is a failure and it's dying. And it needs to. Um, and, but pretty much every story that's come along has been some kind of variation or rehashing. <laughs> Well, the, the, remember there was modernism and then there was postmodernism. Postmodern. How do you have? How do you get postmodern? <laughs> and I'm, I've heard post postmodernism. Oh, you heard that? okay. Well, then uh, now yeah, we're yeah, there now we go. Really. <laughs> now I'm very clear as to what that is. Good. <laughs> so, yeah, and you know you can you never yeah. run out of posts. So <laughs> the just, other two you didn't know, but post postmodern oh, that I know. Post but. that I got. Yeah, that I got. So then I, it, at some point it'll be uh, modern postmodern thrice removed because <laughs> we'll have to shorten. Other side. On my father's side, we'll have to sh we'll have to shorten it. Um, 
I completely forgot where we <laughs> completely forgot where we where where we were. But yeah, the story falls apart. We have to have a we have to have a new one. But I I think what and naming that new one. And na- yes, and and, and naming it. that new one. But what I like about this one is that it is a wholesale replacement and and not just a rehashing. That um it's really clear to me that what is emerging is a completely new definition of humanity, a completely different consciousness. Yes. That is a consciousness that has, you know, we've already experienced the, conscious, the consciousness which has liberated itself from complete dependence upon the physical environment. We now have the capacity to basically transcend the limits that were imposed on us by uh, uh, nature, but we haven't transcended our own our own natures as of yet. They have yet to be uh, transformed that allow it to wield that kind of power um, in hum- humanely. And in order to do that, we have to define hum- humanity. We have to define heaven. We have to know what this actually is. What does it mean to be harmonious? What does it mean to be human? where we're writing the story, where we are no longer bound by uh, any external rules whatsoever. The only thing we're bound by is the limits of our own love and imagination. And, and yep, it's tumultuous. It's, a, it's, it, it's inevitably tumultuous because, you know, if you're gonna, you know, it's kind of a mess when you raise one building to put up another and you're not just doing renovations anymore. And, uh, and so this, I mean, the idea of, <laughs> the idea, when I just take it back to me, because what else can I do? I don't want to speak about heaven abstractly. For me, it's that series of of events that punctuate my life where just everything stops and I'm totally present and there's total harmony and I'm in the midst of this incredible experience of beauty and oneness, which is like looking at a flower or a sunset, not even this, you know, some kind of spiritually ecstatic state. It's like this everyday kind of, thing and i see well why not perpetually why not universally god knows there's enough of it around us (laughs) that it's only a matter of us seeing it that uh, as you said you know we somewhere along the line we got the idea that heaven was out there and so we assume it's not here and so we act as if it's not here and in fact it's it's right here (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and every single one of us can talk about it because it's right here. <laughs> We're all looking at it. <laughs> it's. I mean, I, I, I'm listening to you going, I think that's why we're brothers. I, I, I just love listening to you. Uh, yes, it's you. right here. The, the belief that we were kicked out of the garden and can't go back in, which is not accurate. I have a whole section of my book about that. But what, this is the garden. Our job right. is to make this into the garden. Yes. That and actually, it was the eating. making this into the garden. It was the eating of that fruit that started to divide everything um, that made us believe we had been thrown out of the garden. That was all our imagination. You were never thrown out. I want to talk a little bit about the, the notion of the Garden of Eden that you just raised. And... Um, what I've found out. So early on in the in the work on heaven and earth and in writing the book, I began to think about have we as humanity ever experienced heaven on earth? That is to, the totality of humanity. And the answer is yes, when we were in the Garden of Eden. That was all of humanity and we were experiencing heaven on earth. Okay. God says don't eat from the, the tree. They did. They get kicked out. And so um, I'm Jewish and I'm I'm talking to this Orthodox rabbi. And I said, I asked him, when we got kicked out, who got kicked out? Was it Adam and Eve or was it all of us? And he said, no, it's all of us because the phrase in Hebrew is ha-adam, the Adam, indicating the collective. Mm. So I said, okay, we're out, fine. And then, GP, this thought popped into my mind. And I said to him, does it say anywhere in the Torah that after we got kicked out, that we can't go back in again. 
And he said, I don't know. No one's ever asked that before. Let me go and find out. So I said, okay. So he comes back the next day and he says, no, it doesn't. <laughs> no. <laughs> I can, GP, I can still remember that. I, almost falling off my chair. It doesn't say we can't go back in. And, and, and further. That's I a little oversight in religious history, don't you think? <laughs> Oops. I forgot. Oops. Nobody noticed that little blip. <laughs> so, so, um, so I began to look in Hebrew. I began to read what the, in Genesis, I think, 3.23. Don't quote me on that, but something like that. God kicks them out and God sends them out. Two verbs are used. And they're not the same verb, which just fascinated me. One verb is uh, vigaresh, which means to send out. And it means to send out. And so I said, well, to send out, but does that mean just one way? And, and the rabbi said, no, because garesh is also used in Judaism in divorce. So the man sends the woman out of the house, i.e. divorce. Mm. And I said, but if I don't remarry and, and my ex-wife doesn't remarry, can't we get remarried again? Can't we go back together? And he said, as long as you're not remarried, yes, you can. So I said, so then the verb is not one way. And he said, no, it's not. I went, wow. Second verb is vayashlech, which means to send out with a mission. They were sent out of the garden with a mission. I'm saying that mission is to make this into the garden. That is our mission. So Judaism a whole different view on uh, on that uh, the story of Adam and Eve. Then I go to Christianity. What does Christianity say? Christ is the truth, the way, right? Through me, you can experience yes. everlasting, so on, so on. In other words, that it is possible to go back in Christianity through Christ. Okay, fine. So now I have Judaism and Christianity. Then I go to Islam. <laughs> and Islam says... <laughs> We're lining them all up. We're lining them up. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Islam says uh, when you die, you go to paradise. And, and so the bastardization, you know, the terrorists blowing themselves and other people up. And that's the way that we go to heaven. That's the bastardization of that. And so I thought, oh, nuts, that's not going to work in Islam then. And so I met a, a Sufi uh, man who said, well, Martin, the so one interpretation of that is physical death. And then you go to paradise. But he said, there's another interpretation of death, which is egoic death. And I went, oh, my God. So you can experience egoic death here now and go into paradise. Thus, all three Abrahamic religions, if you look deeply, do not say you can't go back in. GP, that is an enormous revelation for me. Enormous. That is, uh, in, yeah, that is. That's deeply significant. It yeah. is. Because the assumption we, has always been there's no way back. Correct. Yeah, it was a one-way ticket. It was a one-way ticket. Not true. Not true. <laughs> we made it. We made it all up. Yeah, we just we've we've lived for thousands of years under assumptions, and. and this, uh, this is one of the most basic one that oh, we can't have it, have it here now on earth. I right. mean, imagine, so, so we can have some wonderful experiences, but I mean, we still have to have war and poverty and hunger. And why? Why? Why, why does that kind of deep suffering, you know, when I, when I see suffering that just makes me crazy and it's, and it's unnecessary suffering. It's all unnecessary. It is all so, totally created by our own assumptions and beliefs that have simply hardened our hearts. And you know, I think one of the ways in which we go back into the garden is that we, we, our hearts are broken to the point where we experience genuine empathy. When the line between you and me blurs and your pain becomes my pain. When I can feel your pain, I can no longer inflict pain on you. I mm. have to become, uh, I have to become closed to it, in order to in order to allow you to suffer or to cause you suffering. My heart has to harden. It has to. And 
in my experience, the more my heart is simply opened, the more I've felt others, the less harm I'm capable of doing. It's not a moral thing anymore. It's not, you know, behavioral. You don't do that because it's not good. It's like, it hurts when I do it. <laughs> so I don't do it, <laughs> right? It's a self-correcting system. And to, to me, it's kind of the essence of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, that's kind of the, the self-regulating morality that is the morality Moses spoke of when he saw the day when the law would be written in our hearts and not just imposed on us from the, uh, from, from the outside. And which, of course, immediately opens up. Where is that originating from? It's originating from that essential unity, which is the experience of heaven on earth. Because when I feel that openness and I feel others' joy, I, I, I can have that too. That same door that allows me to just take on the sufferings of others and be willing to be with them compassionately and, and to seek and to seek seek their benefit as well as my own opens the door for the same level of celebration of 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 of, of others that I would for myself. Sometimes it's even better. <laughs> Very Sometimes profound. it's even more intense. You know, the less there is me of me there, the more intense that joy, the the joy of others, and I'm I'm sure that's exactly what the Sufi was referring to in egoic death. Right, the ego is a blind spot in humanity. It is the it is the it's the selfish part that can't see beyond itself. It's not a mistake. It's part of our development. It was part of what developed developed us as far as we got but one of the biggest uh, uh, biggest transitions that's taking place is the universal death of the of the ego as being the the force that it is I mean it's it is what's running countries in the world and it's what creates wars and divisions and and uh, and the like it is this 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 functioning of the human nervous system that we have not seen through yet well, you said something I've, I've never heard before. Yeah, the universal death of the ego. Um, uh, Ken Wilber did something that was very interesting, or I heard about this secondhand, that the word I, he traces the egos showing up around 1500. Don't quote me on the exact dates, but anyway, and the way he did that was by looking at literature before and after roughly that time. And around that time, I started to show up. And so your notion now of uh, the universal death of the ego, I don't know how we would know that uh, here, but for me, that's a phenomenal question to begin looking to see how it is not here. How the ego is not here? How the un yes, how the universal, e in the same way that the ego showed up, say around the 1500s through uh. literature, how is universal ego now dissolving? H how do I know that? And so I'm going to start looking for ways in which I can see that because you've introduced this new notion to me of the death of the universal ego. Well, I, I, you know how I know, you know, I know it's happening. Yeah. It's happening to me. And when I look around, I see very similar experiences happening and I go, okay, so it's not, it's not some great thing for me. I am experiencing something that's happening on a universal level. And you kind of see it. You see these pockets. Of, well, I mean, in, in, in your book, and we've, we've talked about this, or 63 examples on your site, there are pockets of light around, pockets of heaven and earth. They're not getting in the press. They're not being seen. But they have all the earmarks of a of an entire culture that's based on mutuality rather than egoism. That it's about mutual collaboration, about oneness, about heavenliness, rather than about competition and, and, uh, and, and hoarding and winning. And it's ha it happened in me. I mean, I started out as anybody else, wanted to win and get all the stuff and be, I want to be a rock star, right? And it was like life itself just kept wearing me down. Right, 
and showing me other other things. So it's not like it was this great revelation. I was rather, you know, the reluctant sage. <laughs> but it, 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 there was something um, again, again, it's inevitable. Mm, beautiful. About it that was like beautiful. way way beyond me. And there's a great quote from Anthony DeMello who said, enlightenment is total surrender to the inevitable. And that's what it felt like. That in fact, the thing that was resisting the inevitable was the ego. And it was nothing but fight and struggle and suffering because it, the ego wants to go its way, but life is not going that way. And, <laughs> and you know, if you have an argument with life, you lose. Yeah.